Okay, so welcome and thank you for those that were able to show up live and I know some are watching the streaming and some are going to watch the recording later, but I just, I just felt like um, what I was hearing from people and patients and even practitioners I just got off from talking to practitioners for an hour that you know people are feeling a little heavy and a little challenged and that's why I said we need to gather you know we need to come together we need to talk I want to share some ideas of sort of what I've seen over the last two years and what's going on right now and then mostly I just wanted to be able to answer your questions so it's not like a monologue I'm not going to just talk at you the whole time I want to share a little bit of information and then please um, you know ask some questions so the first thing I said, which was sort of in the intro is, you know, the heaviness of like having been in a pandemic and then the civil rights and then the weather issues and the fires and, um, you know, war, you know, just all of these challenges are like hits that can, you know, feel like they, they're not stopping, like they keep coming. I'm definitely, I mean, I think I've uh, felt it myself. Absolutely. But in patients, I'm seeing, um, you know, the, it's a different level of stress and a different level of anxiety. People who had anxiety before, it might be through the roof now, but some people who never had it before are experiencing it. You know, kids are experiencing it. I'm not going to talk to you about all the bad things because you know the bad things. What I want to talk is about, um, you know, what we're going to do about it and what it means for you and, uh, you know, how we can make a shift. One of the things I was just telling the practitioners is that even in the midst of terrible times, because there's, you know, there's always something hard going on, right? Uh, even in the midst of terrible times, we can have opportunity to still create good, or at least even see the good. And that's something we really have to, you know, do as much as possible um, and not get bogged down. I've talked a little bit about news, not having like news on 24 seven. If you're in a household where like Fox News is always playing or CNN or, you know, whatever your preferred station is, but it's always in the background or maybe it's the radio, NPR or something like you have to turn it off. You don't want to stick your head in the sand and be uninformed. And but you don't want to just be having one hit after another because uh, we have to take care of ourselves. So that's very um, important. One of the other things I was sharing is that if you weren't disciplined in the calm, you're not going to get disciplined in the chaos. And when I had first heard that, that just like really hit home to me. Um, and especially when I was talking to all the doctors, you know, some people, they, they're very talented, they're very smart, they're very scrappy. And so they were able to like succeed or go to medical school or, um, be great in their, you know, CEO job or, or be mom extraordinaire, you know, whatever, whatever their daily work was, they're able to be great in it without discipline because they were smart and scrappy and had talent. But then when like a big challenge, like what we've had for the last two years, and now this news of war and, and just this like ongoing hammer, when these kinds of stressors come on, some of these people find that talent and smarts and scrappiness isn't just enough. They need discipline. And this just really hit me hard. And I was talking to my kid about this and talking to my partner and just everyone I could because it's like, okay, so what are the areas where I'm not disciplined? What are the areas where you're not disciplined? And I was able to just look back and be like, oh yeah, when the pandemic started and we were staying home, these are the areas I had trouble with because I wasn't disciplined in that area no wonder it like blew up in my face. Those are the areas I have to work. Um, the other areas where I was disciplined, that was easy, right? I mean, I don't want to say easy. It was still hard going through pandemic, but those, those areas didn't crash and burn, right? Um, now, patient community, a lot of times it's that self-care or it's gut issues or it's a hormone imbalance or it's a weight gain. Those are the issues that really crash and burn because the whole Western lifestyle is not set up where like self-care and TLC and fabulous eating and meditating and sleep, it's not set up as a priority. So all, you know, work and performance and, you know, all of those things are set up as a priority. And then when you get in a big challenge like this, you're not disciplined, this stuff can blow up. So 
that's something that I've seen. And how do we get out of it? There's so many things I could say about this. Um, one thing is, I don't know if you've seen, but I've been training, you know, I've always trained other practitioners, but I've been really intensely training other physicians and nutrition professionals for the last year. And um, I, I've been the clinical director at Body Love Cafe, but I stopped seeing individual patients. And I've noticed that in times like this, it's not enough to just be the health detective and share this amazing information, which is what I've always done. And I love it. And I've gotten better and better at it over the years and over the months and every single day, put so much work into it. But um, it's not enough anymore. You know, people used to like knock me down. They had to knock me down to become a patient. I was so casual about it. Like, here's your menu of services. And if you want it, great. If not, no problem. And, and I, sometimes I'd like a three month waiting list or more. And the people who wanted to work with me, it was fabulous. And when they did what, what I said to do, they got great results. But if someone got busy or fell to the wayside, I didn't have a way to like necessarily track them. You know, I'm just being totally honest here. And, and I was so busy. It was like, gosh, what happened to that person? Well, they had a flood in their house and they, you know, missed an appointment and then sort of fell off our radar. So now I'm doing it differently. And, and not just me, my whole clinic's doing it differently for several reasons. One is with the stressors we have, it takes more heroic work to get transformation. And I want transformation for my patients, whether they're seeing another doctor or they're seeing me. So I'm only taking 10 patients right now for four months. That's it. That's all I'm doing. And um, they have to apply <laughs> and I'm handpicking them, uh, the ones to work with me. Um, but even for uh, the rest of our practitioners, we're working in like four month increments and bringing all the amazing like, you know, detective work. What's going on? What do you need to do? But, th but this is the key. This is the real difference. What are like atomic habits, right? What are the, what's the power of tiny gains, incremental improvement? What does it take to change habits? What does it take to get results? And I think that's the hardest part, honestly. And it's hard in different ways for every person, but that's what we are tackling and, and, doing it in a way we've never done before. And I was telling the other doctors, this is not something I'm just saying to you, um, but I was telling the other doctors, like there's a different way you have to show up for your patients, right? And so, you know, you're, you're not a practitioner or most of you won't be, but um, maybe you're a parent, right? And you have a kid who's going through a hard time. One of the ways I was describing it, one of my mentors had said this was, you can't fall in the hole with them. Uh, maybe someone's depressed, maybe someone's gained weight, maybe it's the news weighing on them. You can't fall in the hole with them because then all of a sudden you're both in it and no one can get out. You have to stay outside of the hole and extend a ladder down and help them to climb out. So I'm giving the call to the practitioners uh, to do this and how to do this. And I'm giving the call to the patients who are helping someone else to do that. And then all of our practitioners to help it with our patients. So that's very, very um, important. And what does it take um, to really make that change? The other thing, I, I'm having very real conversations with people that I haven't had before. Like, I can't be of service to you if you are in disservice to yourself, which is why I'm having patients apply to see me. Because if they say honestly, like, ah, I don't know, you know, I don't mind if someone's upset. I don't mind if they're sad. I don't mind if they're commute, confused. I don't mind if they don't know how. I don't even mind if they get grumpy or argue about something. I can handle all that. But if they don't have a desire for the change and at least a willingness, I'm not going to be able to help facilitate that for them, right? So um, they, they have to really want it um, and, and have to be very, you know, very mindful of that. And, uh, and then we can educate them, work with them, make it interesting, track it and bring them to another level. So that's really um, what we're doing. So whether you're one of our patients or just someone from the community hopping on and seeing this, whether it's your health or some other area, um, 
you have to get some help with the discipline and notice the areas where you're not disciplined. Maybe food's not the issue for you. Maybe you're great and like you cook family meals and you're nailing that, but maybe it's the movement piece or maybe it's the mental health or the argumentative or not taking your supplements or you don't drink water or whatever it is. Um, but whatever, whatever that thing is, in fact, I'll just say this. The more challenging it is for you, the longer you've had to deal with it, the more you're like, ah, I don't know why I don't make that change. Or the more you're like, I don't even like know how, or not even sure about dealing with this. You're going to need that much more help around it. So that's actually like, even in my, not, not just my, my personal life with my patients, even in like in my business, you know, I'm looking at it in a different way. What's the thing I don't want to do. I'm going to need more help around it. You know, maybe it's clutter, you know, clutter in your environment can impact your health and impact your um, relationships. And some people, you know, I have patients with like severe um, ADHD and they literally cannot reverse engineer the process to solve certain things doesn't mean they're not brilliant in so many other ways, but because of, um, you know, the parts of their, um, brain that, uh, are impacted, they can't like re you know, reverse engineer the steps to get to the end goal. And then they're more prone, not that anyone can't have clutter, but they're more prone to have clutter because they can't necessarily Re, you know, reverse engineer the systems to create the organization and then maintain it. So that would be an example of where you'd need to bring someone in to provide some support and even um, ideally hire a professional. But if that wasn't, you know, a possibility, that's a category where you could like ask a good friend to be there with you and, and help. Um, you know, some areas like health things, right? You can't ask your friend and you, you might ask your neighbor, but don't, <laughs> they don't know what's going on. They're not going to be able to customize it. And just because diet X, Y, Z worked for them, doesn't mean it's going to work for you, right? Everyone's unique. Um, so make sure you get some help, but, um, but yeah, the tougher something seems or the longer it's been a problem or the more you want to hide from it, or there's some negative pattern around it or you just have a hard time bringing in that new pattern, the more support you're going to need around it. So that's something we're building into uh, our office with our patients. I'm teaching all the other doctors to do it in a new way, um, but we're bringing it into our personal lives too. And behind the scenes, I think it's something even I'm doing it as a parent also um, what we're calling like educating and then gamifying and then an action and then trackable. Like there has to be actual goals, um, trackable milestones. Do we hit the result? If not, why? So that's something we're doing in a completely different way. And when that happens, not that we won't have feelings, but you get to operate more in facts. And that's super important because we can have a lot of feelings, um, just even like the war that's going on right now. It's awful. Like I like I cried watching part of that speech from the Ukraine president, but I can't stay in that energy all day long. And uh, something I was just talking to the doctors about, like I was saying, if you feel compelled, um, in fact, I have a great resource. If someone wanted to donate to someone who's like hands-on, I have a, a great resource for you. But if someone felt compelled to like do a drive in their community or their practice or their HOA or whatever it is, you know, by all means do it. But if that's not your thing, you don't have to do it. Maybe you want to donate money or maybe you just need support around dealing with the stress with it. Maybe your, your passion and your compassion really goes to another area. That's okay too. Um, but the thing I was saying to them is they need to not stop working, right? They still have to do what their expertise is. So whatever it is they do, they have to keep showing up just like teachers do and our frontline workers do and the moms do and the dads do. So whatever it is, even when the world seems to be falling apart, you still have to show up with your main job and your main gift and move forward. So you have to be very careful about, you know, the energy that's around you. All right. Here's another thing that, um, and then I'm just going to take questions, but another thing I'm doing differently. And I, I told the, um, 
I just told the doctors about it. I told them a little bit more detail because, you know, they're dealing with patients all the time. But, um, you know, my personality is just to focus on the good stuff and to really like hold space for people. And that's great. I, I made people feel really good. But my patients sort of had to like knock me down to become a patient. And then I'd wow them with information and the ones that, you know, did what I recommended, got great results and were high-fiving each other. And I'd see great transformation and loved it. But there were some people who fell through the cracks, just being totally honest. And I was thinking of one who like had a flood at home and missed an appointment. And then I wasn't even like able to call and say like, how are you doing? Because we were so busy. I didn't even like... I didn't have an open appointment for like three months. So that's why I'm only working with 10 patients right now. Um, but, um, but it was just very like, here's our menu of services, right? We're Body Love Cafe. Here's our menu of services. If there's something you want, go for it. And really like, just there it is if you want it and that's it. I didn't like confront people or challenge them with like, why am I trying to teach you how to be healthy if I don't educate you about the pain of staying sick or if you work in another industry like how do you teach people to be smarter if you don't first teach them the pain of staying dumb or how to be rich if you don't teach the pain of staying broke and I never focused on that part at all I was just it just wasn't my thing. Now I realize I did people a bit of a disservice and some people, um, you know, fell through the cracks because I didn't talk to them about what it would really mean if they didn't um, move forward. And then everyone makes their own decision, right? But I left out half of the puzzle. And I'm not doing that anymore. And I'll, I'll give you one reason. I, I, I said the statement about if you weren't disciplined in calm, you weren't going to get disciplined in chaos. And I gave the example of, you know, people are smart, or scrappy, or something came easy. They were just sort of able to get away with it. Well, there were some areas like when the pandemic hit, I saw this for other people. I saw it for myself. There were some areas where, yeah, the ones I was good at, I, I showed up in a big way, but the ones that I, were, I was slippery and not disciplined in, that sort of like blew up in a challenging way. Um, I had gained some weight and that was really uncomfortable and I've done it before and I've had to lose it and I help people do it all the time. So, you know, I know exactly what to do, but had I been more disciplined in some of those areas, it wouldn't have happened to begin with. So that was an interesting lesson. And what was the support I needed around that to maintain it? Okay. Um, and then the other thing I thought was really interesting was I, I didn't really want to take the steps to do what it took to get it off, <laughs> you know? And I have had patients like that. I was like, here's what you need to do to get better. And it's like, oh, it's just one excuse after another. And I'm gonna do this instead. And the thing that was really an insight for me was it wasn't just focusing on even the immediate health thing. Like what was the consequence of like keeping the weight on? That's important to point out. In this moment, even that was not motivating enough. What became motivating was actually looking at what is it I want to do like in other areas in my life and how is this impacting it? Like, can I even go do that new thing? Will I have like the energy to show up in that way? Um, and when it was sort of framed in that way, uh, then doing the healthy things became easy and it was not an effort. It was a complete mental shift. So I think this is something really important and something we certainly can try to do as much as possible for ourselves, but we need um, partners and mentors and doctors and coaches and whatever support we need around it, an organizer or something to help hold us accountable and see our own blind spots and, you know, really be a, a better version of ourselves. So it's something I've started doing with patients, you know, it's not just you know, here's the amazing things we figured out that's going on. And here's the wonderful things we're going to do to solve it. It's like, why are you struggling to make the change? Why are you resistant to this new thing? Um, why is it you 
shifted this one thing and it only lasted two weeks and you couldn't maintain that habit, what was getting in the way of it? So it's a completely different way of looking at life and working with people. And I think, um, I just think these last two years of these challenges and seeing how it impacted everyone around me, patients, practitioners, and what it takes to really come out of that um, brought that insight to me. We, we need to show up in a different way to get the transformations now. Okay, I see a question about symptoms between hypothyroidism and mold illness. They seem to overlap. Um, okay, so let me just say something about overlapping symptoms, and then I'm going to get to the rest of the question. And uh, anyone can put a question in or ask a, you know, unmute yourself and ask a question. But here's the thing about overlapping symptoms. We were just talking about this with um, dealing with some liver issues recently and then talking about um, some patients um, and some family members that were connected to this person in the past. It was like, how did someone, you know, still have this issue? Like, you know, why is it this person had that gallbladder issue and that person had that gallbladder issue? Or why did that person have a thyroid issue and then that person did? So um, part of it is because the circumstances might be the same. So we have to look at the mechanism. And then the other thing is because although we're all unique, we only have so many organs to play with, right? So if something's going to go wrong in a cascade, there's only so many areas in the body you can affect. And then even with the symptoms, um, like I'm teaching, uh, doctors for eight hours on Saturday, all about hormones. So we're doing thyroid, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, DHEA. Um, uh, what else am I forgetting? Um, uh, hypothalamus, pituitary hormones, you know, just the whole, the whole cascade. Right. And all of these things are interconnected. Sometimes I describe it like you have like a silver platter with a bunch of golf balls on it. And these are the different hormones and you nudge it just a little bit. They all impact one another. If one gets a little bit too out of line, it shakes up and all the balls fall off the platter, right? So they, they interact with one another. And even something like you think about hypothyroidism and how that impacts weight, for example, right? You tend to uh, gain some weight if you get hypothyroid. But that's not the only hormone that's going to cause you to gain weight. Uh, too much cortisol can cause you to gain weight. Um, too much insulin can cause you to gain weight. Um, too little of other hormones can cause you to gain weight, right? So, so you can see overlapping symptoms and you have to go backwards and find out where it's coming from. And then no one wants to think about this, but you're allowed to have more than one thing go wrong at a time. Okay, so let's get into the specifics. So I just want to say that in general. Um, so if someone can't get a full thyroid panels and, and is told there's nothing wrong with their thyroid, how are you able to determine if you're living in a mold situation? So first of all, um, get the thyroid, get the full thyroid panel. There's many ways to do it. We order it all the time for people. Um, and if for some reason that wasn't an option, there's a lot of times you can just even order things like direct to patient, you know, direct to consumer it costs more. So we can get it um, cheaper for patients. But if you're trying to go through like insurance and they only want to order like TSH, um, yeah, that's not going to tell you enough information. But usually you can get your primary care doctor to order um, TSH and uh, free T4 and free T3. So that helps a bit more. Um, but like you want antibodies and you want things like that. But if you're not going to get reverse T3 and T3 uptake, I mean, that's fine. You can live without that. But the basics that look at, you know, where in that thyroid cascade is the system really having like negative feedback or it's broken, like where, where is the train going off the tracks? You need a full thyroid and it's, it's really not uh, too pricey to get that done. So I would say um, you, you need that. That's one of those areas. There's some things where like, oh, we can't get that lab. We can go and do some work. But uh, a thyroid panel, not too pricey, and you really want to see it. And it's going to change, too. So you want to be able to monitor it and retest as needed. Um, mold, let's just talk about mold for a second. Um, you know, mold is really problematic. No, mold and yeast are under fungus, right? And uh, uh, both can be common, particularly yeast. Uh, Candida is the most common. Um, 
but mold, you don't always test for it. I mean, it would be nice to always test for it, but sometimes those tests can be a bit pricey. But a good clinician would know questions to sort of identify it. Or maybe there's a workaround, like, for example, one of our allergy tests we get. So people are testing for true food allergies and food sensitivities. It covers, um, you know, four or five different immune aspects for food. There's a marker for mold on it and a marker for yeast. So sometimes you need a practitioner who understands little creative ways. Like I don't have to order three different tests, right? I don't have to say like, here's your allergy test. Here's your candida test. Here's your mold test. I can just get this one, right? And most of the times it will pick it up. Now, if, if it was some crazy complex story, story, uh, story, we've tried everything else. We think there's like some hidden mycotoxin damage. Maybe we're going to get that advanced. Um, so mycotoxins are the, um, the toxins from mold, right? So maybe we're going to get that advanced test, but otherwise a lot of times you don't have to do that. So I don't like offices that the patient comes in and they're like, everyone has to buy this, you know, $5,000 set of labs. I don't mind if you need a set of visits, if you're trying to accomplish something specific, but I still think the lab should be customized ideally. I know it's easier for the practitioners to just say, get these. But the reason we don't do that is I don't want a patient to pay for something they don't need. And I don't want to not order a test that I think would be revealing and provide information that would help um, clinically. Sometimes you don't have to test for mold because if they're living in a mold situation, as you're saying, you know what's going on. And if if you can actively see the mold, you know it's present in the house and they have the symptoms, you know you have a problem already and what can you do with it? Number one, you want to try to get out of that mold situation. Very hard to um, you know, fully recover from this when you're still in the negative environment. So that's sort of priority number one. But there's a lot of things we can do. I mean, we've got certain um, supplements, we've got foods that are really great at binding to um, mycotoxins or aflatoxins, you know, things to help eliminate them from the body and how to do that in a way so you don't feel miserable in the process and things to help with some of the symptoms, right? Mold can have really diverse symptoms. So when you're saying there can be some, you know, thyroid overlap, sure. Um, but mold, you know, the mold can have a, a lot of different symptoms uh, like uh, metal toxicity too. So there's, there's certain commonalities like metal toxicity, um, really deep fatigue can be really common, but someone, they might get like little zinger headaches, like these little sharp headaches. Um, someone else, it might be skin issues, uh, mold, like, you know, allergy, brain fog, like really serious brain fog. Those are definitely some of the um, common mold uh, issues, but, they could be having some GI issues, you know, they could be having other things. So that's the fun, at least for the practitioners in functional medicine is really diving in and looking at it all and figuring out exactly what it is and, and then figuring out the, how to like triage it and how to work with it. Um, Cause let's say you had a number of labs and they came up as, um, you know, positive, you don't, you don't give something for every marker, right? You, you'd have to have a suitcase for everything you have to take. So, and you don't necessarily wanna do everything at once anyway. So there's a lot of things to consider. Uh, let's see, you said landlord compounded over it, sand it down to make it look pretty. Um, yeah, you know, uh, mold can take a bit more to get rid of it. Like let's say mold on food. You know, you have, you've seen mold on cheese. And by the time you see a little bit of that white on the cheese, people want to cut off the end and eat the rest of the cheese. There's spores that have gone all the way through it and you can't see it. You have to throw out the whole block. So sometimes that happens with surfaces also, and you can't just pretty it up. Um, in fact, we did this in our house when we were laying down flooring, the person who had it before in the, in the laundry room, there had been a flood or something. And there was an area with a bit of mold. So we had to like tear out that area and my husband can tell you more about it because I'm not going to remember like the names and stuff, but there were things we had to do to treat it and repair it. So if someone was, um, 
you know, really sick. I mean, I had a friend who went through this in a renting situation and it was quite a battle with the landlord to get them to deal with it. And they did end up moving and they won their battle, but it took them years. So sometimes you have to say to yourself, is it worth fighting in a rental situation for it? Or would it be better for my health just to move? And uh, I'm not going to tell you which one's right because you know for yourself what would be right. Um, is it a situation where you can do some repair yourself or is it just easier to get a different place? Um, or are the symptoms coming from something else, right? So before you move out, maybe find out what else is going on and if there is something else. But if you know you're having serious symptoms from mold and it's not gone out of the environment, you want to get out of that environment. I remember a patient I worked with um, and we made a ton of progress, but the problem was she was in a mold environment at work and um, was not able to get out of the situation. So there was a lot we had to do. It, it was problematic. So that's why I'm saying like moving might actually be easier than staying in a moldy environment. So it's unique for everyone. You can get your home tested too. So if you've had mold uh, remediated in your home and you wanna know if it's still there. I, if you're local, I can't remember the, um, the name, but there's a company out of Emeryville um, and you could get them to come and test. So those are some options. But otherwise, yeah, like, you know, watch the water in your house. Uh, you know, yeast happens more often. Right? Mold, especially in foods can be fair, fairly common, but yeast overgrowth and candida tends to happen more often. And one of the ways I would describe to people is like, you know, think of the bathroom, like a corner of the tub or something, if there's some dirt uh, there or definitely some organic matter and it doesn't get uh, cleaned up, it's like a dark, wet area. And then you see this mold grow, right? And so all, all fungus is like that. And that can happen in the body. So, um, and, and candida can repopulate very quickly. Okay, are there any other questions? Yeah, well, if you can't move, then we just have to try to get you as healthy as um, possible and, uh, and see if that's really a, a problem or not. So maybe even testing the area would be helpful. I wanted to share with you, let's see, here is a link. I wanted to share this for those who were interested um, in that Ukraine thing I was talking about, because this came from someone um, who was quite, um, let's see, I have to post it, in, I have to copy it in two things because it's a bit long. Um, let's see, 24 hours, okay. Um, so this is a little bit of verbiage I put into chat. If you feel like you wanted to donate and you wanted something where it was like, you know, you feel like sometimes you donate to organizations and is it even helping or getting someone hands? I wanted to share this because like I said, this came from a source, someone who does, who's an amazing do-gooder in the world. And, um, this is really hands-on helping people, even if you're not donating, but you want to share with someone else, that can be a great thing to share. I also, um, I had a link, where was it? For those of you, I know some of you are patients in our community. Um, as we change over to some of our new systems and how we're working, you can schedule a no charge consult. I mean, anyone could, but you can schedule a no charge consult and talk to our team and find out what we're doing and see what makes sense for you. And then I already have a, a several people to go through. I'm only taking 10 and some spots are already full. If you apply, don't apply again. I see you um, and I will, I will get to you. I'm gonna send out some emails tomorrow. So if you're already applied, don't worry about it. But if someone's interested, you could apply there. And don't, and don't feel like you have to work with me at all because I'll try to talk you out of it and get you to work with one of our other doctors. But um, I do have some people who wanna work with me specifically. So I'm taking 10 people every four months. We're doing an intense group. I'm their practitioner. Um, and honestly, you know, this is part of how 
we're taking this information of, of what does it take for people to get transformational results when you know they're two years deep into a pandemic, the hits keep coming and uh, life looks different for us. So what does it take? So, um, so we're moving everyone into a different scenario, staff's being trained differently. A, lo a lot of things are turning around and for the first four months, people are having visits like every 10 days. They're either meeting with their practitioner or they're having a health coaching visit. And this is very specific and intentional. So even if you're not one of our patients, maybe it's something you can talk to your practitioner about, but um, not just getting to the root cause of what's going on, but what will it take to change it? Being able to start with like smaller protocols, make adjustments and have this consistent consistency and accountability to make the habit changes. So I'm really sort of passionate about where this, where this is going. Um, so that's something we're doing. The other thing I'm doing that I haven't done before, and I'm sure there's other clinics already doing it, but um, is I'm going to do a weekly group Q and A, sort of similar to this, but a little, a little bit different, uh, where maybe for the first 10 minutes, I'll educate on health topic, very short, very specific, very intentional. And then the rest of the time is Q and A, and it's gonna be open to all of our patients. So they don't have to be a private patient of mine. And that's gonna be every week. So like drop in open office hours. Uh, so another way to like consistently get some support and get some questions answered and not have to like wait to the next appointment and, and things like that. So um, I'm pretty excited about those things. All right, um, I know I started talking a little bit about these habit formings in our office because I'm excited about it, but are there any other questions? Uh, let's see, oh, I saw one. Um, so many food plans out there, not sure why stuck, what food plan, how can I keep system moving? You know, I can't recommend like a general food plan. When, um, when we do the body love challenge, that's as general as I can make it and I spend a lot of time trying to teach people about their bodies in the midst of it. So it's a, a plan that's pretty safe for everyone to use. And there's some accountability with the health coaching app. And so that's been a good thing. And we've done that free for years. We're not going to anymore. It's going to be exclusively just for members, but um, I think it goes away tomorrow. <laughs> like if you didn't grab it, you might want to go snag it right now. Um, but that's about as general as I can get. Otherwise, Everyone I work with personally, all the doctors I train and all the practitioners in our office, we customize it per the person. We probably have 30, 40, yeah, like 45 different meal plans, diets, handouts that we pull from regularly. We still individualize them for the person in front of us. In fact, I just made a new one for um, the doctors I trained. So I spent 16 hours training these physicians in GI health because um, there's so much to know. And it's something that I'm really an expert in having worked on it for so many years and trained around the world. And I created a special diet for them to use with their toughest patients that have um, really severe leaky gut and they're highly allergenic and they're super reactive to everything. And they're really inflamed and, you know, they have the brain fog and, you know, diarrhea or loose stools or cramping or weight issues, or they feel bloated all the time. You know, they sort of have it like all going on. They're super sensitive. So it was a very customized um, plan, but one that they can take and it works with the toughest cases, you know? And then like on the opposite extreme, there's like an easy, healthy diet that just about everyone can use. Um, but I don't believe there's a diet just for the, uh, for all of life anyway. I, I almost never have patients where I say, oh, here's your anti-candida diet, or here's your leaky gut diet, or I'm going to have you do like a healthy keto, um, or I'm going to have you do a little bit of intermittent fasting, or um, I'm going to put you on, you know, this meal plan because your hormones are really out of balance. I've never given that and had them stay on it long-term. They're on it for like one month, two, maybe six as we create a shift and then we're going into something else. So we're using food as medicine to get the results we want. And my goal always for patients with food plans 
is to try to get them to a point where they're able to have a diverse diet and not a lot of limitations, not a lot of food obsession or over-regulation. That's my goal. Can everyone get there? No, because some people might have an immunodeficiency or maybe they um, had a bowel resection and they, you know, or they had a, a lap band, right? Um, bariatric surgery. And there's some permanent changes in their life that they're going to have to eat differently for life. That can happen. But for the most part, the goal always is to get a change, get people back to normal, um, get them to the point where they can eat a diverse diet. Because, you know, some of my toughest clay patients, they come in and they can only eat five foods. I don't want them to have to go through the rest of life only eating five foods. That's not healthy. Um, so, you know, what, what does it take? But I can't give them like a, a regular diet to begin with. They're too inflamed. They're too irritated. They can't tolerate any fiber. You know, I just can't do that. So we have to work on things and um, try to support the body and, and introduce foods in a certain way. I mean, there's just a lot to do in individual. So I, I can't, I can't generalize it. I do a complete workup on patients with lab tests to know exactly what they should eat. Otherwise, um, you know, it's just generalized. It's going to be the same as like, you know, talking to your neighbor. Oh, that diet worked for you. Great. Oh, that diet worked for you. I mean, every diet worked for someone at some point, but, um, and if it's not a big issue, then you probably don't need a specialized diet or a meal plan. You just need to make wise choices. I mean, most diets like cut out sugar and, um, junk foods and preservatives and, you know, right. The big things that might be enough for people and they don't need a specialized meal plan, but for, for the ones that, you know, have symptoms, you know, food is the biggest piece. And I can just, I can just even tell you personally, um, because I have some health challenges, like some I totally resolve with functional medicine, which is fabulous. Some are permanent. Like I live with an immunodeficiency. You can't like, I have patients where we work to strengthen their immune system. That's great. It's like uh, the football team came and they were feeling a little tired and not very strong. We're able to make them more robust and happy. Whereas for me, it's like half the football team didn't show up. So I can't strengthen, you know, half of a football team that's not even there. Right. So there's certain challenges um, that I have to live with. But I can tell you that there's been phases in my life where I feel pretty phenomenal and there's phases where I feel like really crummy and, uh, and there can be different reasons for it. But the one variable that's always common is when I feel my best, you know, my, I'm, I'm eating healthy, my food's dialed in and not just healthy. Cause I mean, I, even when I eat wrong, I eat healthy cause I've been doing this for a long time. Um, but when my health is the most challenged, I'm eating things, even healthy foods that don't serve me. And everyone else would say it's fine. Every diet plan online, most doctors would say it's fine. Um, zucchini's great for you. And um, you should have some almonds. You know, I'm just trying to think of a few things and some tomatoes. And I'm sick when I eat those. And I know exactly why, and I know what the reasons are. So uh, with that specialized knowledge, I can make decisions and decide, do I wanna just like eat that junk and feel, it's not junk, but it's junk to my body. Eat that junk for my body and feel really crummy, or do I want to um, you know, show up in a way where I'm not gonna be inflamed and I'm not gonna be irritated and I'm not gonna feel depressed and I'm not gonna be bloated and I'm not gonna hang on to weight and I can think crystal clear and now I'm sleeping well, right? Um, and let me just say, having said that again, hundred percent transparency, there's time in my life and in my patient's life where that knowledge alone is not enough. And we have to tie it to something else. We have to get like underneath why they're not doing it. And, um, cause it's not just knowledge, right? And this is really where the accountability, the habit changing, not just the why of your sick, but why are you not doing the thing you need to do? Like that's where the real work comes from. So anyway, I'm, a, I'm excited uh, to be doing the real work for myself and to help other people do the real work. And thank you for the comments. I see some of the kind comments. I appreciate it. 
Um, are there any other questions? I know we're getting right at the end here. Um, it could be about anything. If I can't answer it, I'll tell you, but if I can, I'm happy to answer it. I was just trying to think if I had anything else um, uh, specific. I'll, I'll, I'll sort of say one general thing. If you have a question, do it. Otherwise, I'll just say sort of a general thing and then sign off with this is, um, I, I already mentioned like watching the low energy around you. Even if you're the one bringing the low energy, I've been that person, okay? I've been the person bringing the low energy, but you gotta watch the low energy. If there's too much low energy around you, it's going to drag you down. So um, you can't you can't have that happening. Um, but the thing I want to sort of end with is to notice the patterns in your life. And this is not like to make you feel bad or blame you or anything like that. It's just human condition. And it's an opportunity for us to shine. So what are the, the patterns in your life? Because those are indicators of future events. And I can really see this in the areas where I've thrived and succeeded and the areas where I've been challenged and I struggled. And now I have a, a different way to tackle it. But the short piece is those patterns you see, first of all, the patterns that are good, feed those, right? Give your attention to that. That's usually pretty obvious because the reason they're good for you is you're already doing it. But the patterns that are problematic, where you slip and where you find issues and where a problem comes back again and keeps coming back, that's the thing that you haven't gotten under yet. What's under it? And that's where you're going to need the discipline, which is not fun. There's nothing fun about discipline. I'll tell you that. Um, I don't like to get up and do the same thing every day, but there's parts of my life where I have to do that. So, um, so that's where you're going to need the most discipline. It's going to be the area where you need the most support. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's smart to ask for help and support when you need it. You know, if someone had cancer and they needed support, you wouldn't think anything of it. If someone, you know, God forbid their house burned down and they need neighborhood support and somewhere to stay and a food train and then an insurance agent and some contractors to come rebuild the house. You don't think anything of it. Of course they need support. That's normal. You know, or if you have a toddler who's learning how to work, walk and talk and they need to be taught things, that's normal. So whatever area in your life, that's a pattern. It's coming around something you're suffering with. You know, I'm focusing on health, but there's other issues too, right? Could be the clutter. Um, that, that's where you're going to need the discipline and that's where you're going to need the most support. And it's okay that it's not going to be fun. Because whoever you go to for support, whether it's us or someone else, um, if, if they're getting under it, you're going to make it happen. It will work. And then you'll be able to do the hard things. They won't be so hard anymore. Right? I, I really get that. I've experienced that myself. All right. Well, I hope this was helpful. I hope you're going to be kind to yourself right now and... Um, don't worry so much about the shoulds, turn the news off a bit. If you feel compelled to help out in some way, in person, financially, writing letters, hugging your neighbor, by all means do it, but don't, um, don't give yourself a lot of rules around this. Like you have to take care of yourself or you won't be able to take care of anyone else. And, uh, and it's normal to feel crummy when things are crummy but we can't just stay in the feelings. We have to also get in the facts too. So remember your main job, taking care of yourself, showing up for your family, taking care of your health, whatever your job is in the community. Don't lose track of that because you know we need you to be your best self. All right, I'll see you all soon. Bye.